we're on the, the oh, help me turn my microphone. There we go. Um, we're on the home stretch now uh, of our exploration of the, the, the book of Philippians, which we've been on for a, a few weeks now. And as I was uh, prayerfully planning this series, the, the theme, the overall theme that was, was standing out to me, which you can see on the, the screen behind me, is, is that of living as citizens of heaven. Because I think that's one of the key things that Philippians is encouraging us to do, living as citizens of heaven. As I was praying through this, I was praying, what might it look like if we all lived like citizens of heaven now. Uh, because one of the main things that, that Paul was trying to do, not only for himself, but also encouraging the church in Philippi to do, was to live out their citizenship as citizens of heaven. In verses uh, 17 and 18, he, he explores quite negatively uh, what it means to have your eyes fixed on this temporary world, uh, to give in to the lure of culture, to abandon faith, and how that road is one that's heading to destruction. And then he says, but our citizenship, our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. So if you're here today and you're a Christian, I don't care what your birth certificate says, your passport says, your driving license says, your primary citizenship, according to the Bible, is that of heaven. I mean, I wouldn't start necessarily filling that out on forms um, (laughs) because I don't want to get emails complaining when you have your passport sent back. Uh, but, But the Bible says that this world is not our home. Uh, but one day we will be home. And so Paul's call to the believers in Philippi was, as citizens of heaven, to have their allegiance not to earthly kings, but to King Jesus. Not to conform with the culture of the world, but to conform rather to the culture of God's kingdom. Uh, To have their eyes fixed on where their faith will one day take them, but also to live out that citizenship and be transformed by that identity in the here and the now. Um, It's interesting, we started by talking about why people join the army. I don't know why I ever joined the army, but um, when I was in the army, I I spent a lot of time away from home. Uh, And I spent a lot of time sleeping in the mud, in the cold, in the damp. Still get a shudder any time anyone mentions Salisbury Plain. Um, Still, it's just, God's got a sense of humour, because that's where all the traffic is on the A303 as well. So I have flashbacks every time I'm sat there, uh, waiting for people to have a look at those stones that are there. Um, um, Horrible place. Um, Seems, see, seems to have its own weather system. I've never known it not to be raining when I'm outside on Salisbury Plain. Um, and in those moments of, of lying in the wet and the cold in damp clothes, thinking about what awful life choices I'd made that led me to that moment, um, what I would often do is just remember that this is just temporary. Uh, this was not my home. Um, and I would think of home, I think of Rach, I think of my dog. Um, this was pre-child days, I'm not elevating the dog above them. I'd imagine how good it was going to feel when I was eventually in that warm, comfortable bed again, with a full night's sleep, with good, warm food, with a hot shower. And that would help get me through the rubbish that was going on. It would, wouldn't take me out of the situation, because I'd still be focused on what I was doing in the here and now, but it would give me some perspective on what it was all about. And it, as I thought about the warmth of home, It would almost create a spark of warmth in me. That that reminder that this was temporary and this was not home. But soon I would be home. Uh, Having our eyes, I think, fixed on our heavenly citizenship as we go through life is is something similar to that. It means that when we're suffering or, or when we're hurting or when we're ill or when we've been betrayed or when life just feels hard, we can remember it feels like that because this is not our home. And we can rest in the assurance, like I did, that we will one day be home in the place where there will be no more crying or mourning or pain or suffering or any of that broken stuff. No broken relationships, no broken promises, no pressure to deny God's truth, no confusion or chaos to live through. That day is not yet, the Bible says, but that day is coming. And as a citizen of heaven, I want to keep my eyes, my mind and my heart fixed on that day. Not to escape from the world, as I said. Not so that I could be living with the fairies, thinking everything's okay when when the world's crumbling around me. Um, Because that certainly wasn't what Paul was doing. He was fully invested in his mission in the world. But he he also had his eyes fixed on heaven. And so like Paul, I want to be someone that's in the world, but not of the world. Um, I want to be an effective disciple in the world, but I don't want to be consumed by the world. So I can have that biggest perspective on what's going on in the here and now. So that might experience that, that deep joy that Paul talks about in Philippians, regardless of all the rubbish stuff that's happening around me. 
And when we do that, it'll help us to live Christ-centred, transformed lives, I believe. And that's what our theme is this week. Uh, What does it mean to be transformed in Christ? What does it mean to practically um, live out our identity as citizens of heaven? If God has done all that we we need him to do, all that needs to be done for us to be saved, then, then is there anything really for us to do anyway? And the answer is, of course, Yes, because as we touched on last week, and and hopefully will become clearer today, is this amazing, beautiful and powerful paradox that the the Bible sort of sets up for us, that's set up by the gospel, and that is so clear in the letter to Philippians, particularly chapter 3, where you've got the first half that's talking all about um, being righteous only through what God has done for us, and the second half talking about what it means to live a transformed life. Uh, And as we explored this last week, if we are a Christian... We can have incredible assurance and confidence in our identity as children of God. We can have complete assurance of the Father's love for us. And we can have that because Scripture says, as we explored last week, that our relationship with God, our identity as sons and daughters, is not based on us. It's not based on the things we do or don't do. It's based on what God has done for us in Jesus. And we thought about last week how freeing that is, how we can take a a big sigh of relief because we don't have to go around carrying the weight of our salvation on our own shoulders. And so if we have our eyes and our faith fixed on Christ, we don't need to spend our lives worrying about whether we're Christian or not or whether we're saved or not. If we've had a bad week, we don't need to feel like we're less of a Christian. Equally, if we've had a really good week, we shouldn't feel like more of one because our identity as children of God, our righteousness in Christ is not based on us, but it's based on the amazing, unending, and overwhelming grace of God. And we need to remind ourselves of that every day, because it is the linchpin that will transform how we see God, how we see ourselves. And so that's the first part of the paradox, which we unpacked last week, security in our identity based on what God has done for us. And then the second part is that equally uh, what Scripture says, what the Gospel sets up and what Philippians makes really clear is that when we grasp that identity of who we are in God, when we begin to comprehend the immense privilege it is to be children of God, the more we'll want to know Christ, the more we'll know Christ, and with the help of the Spirit, the more we will become like Christ. We will be transformed. If there's uh, one thing that the the liberal gospel does really well, it's emphasising the fact that God loves us just as we are, because that is absolutely true. Jesus didn't die for what you might be or what you should be. He died for who you are. And sometimes, if there's a criticism of the evangelical church, of which there are many criticisms, I'm sure, um, we can have such a longing for transformation and growth in holiness that we inadvertently put barriers up to that fundamental truth. Or we expect transformation to come all at once rather than in God's time. But where the liberal gospel falls short is that it's only half the story. Because God doesn't just love us enough to meet us where we are, but he loves us enough not to leave us where we are. The gospel changes us. And that's why Paul says in a letter to the church in Corinth, in 2 Corinthians, we all who with unveiled vases contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So we've got it there, haven't we? Contemplating God's glory, knowing Christ, more security in our identity, and then flowing out of that, with the Spirit's help, comes transformation. When I came to to faith, when I had an experience of the Holy Spirit, some areas of my life were were transformed almost immediately, like it was miraculous. It was just like, whoa, I had this big moment with God, and my priorities changed, my, my values changed, my desires and my habits changed talked about it before, but my unhealthy relationship with alcohol was something that changed really quickly when I came to faith. It wasn't that I was having to try really hard not to drink anymore. It's that the desire to drink myself every weekend to oblivion just wasn't, wasn't there anymore. God had taken that away. Other areas took longer. Some areas are still ongoing, and they'll be ongoing until I'm stood before Jesus. I'm a work in progress. Ask my wife if you want confirmation <laughs> of that. But part of my desire to know Christ more is a desire to be more like him. If we know Christ, then we know that we're called to go on a journey of transformation. Uh, Paul finished last week um, by marveling at the end goal of Christian faith, the day of resurrection. And he ends there again today. Uh, The final destiny, the final victory won through Christ. But then in the very first verse, which we read today, he begins by saying, not that I have already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. You see it? 
Uh, it's not that Paul felt he needed to work for his salvation because he spent the first 11 chapters, uh, 11 verses of chapter 3, telling us that we can earn our salvation. He says again here that it was Christ Jesus who took hold of him and not the other way around. Paul knew his identity in Christ, but Paul also knew that he wasn't the final product. Paul knew there was still more for him. Paul knew he was on a journey of transformation. And if that's true for the Apostle Paul, you better believe it's true for Mike Hudson, and you better believe it's probably true for each of us here today. And so how? I mean, what does that look like? How do we do that? What does that tangibly feel like? Because I don't want us to be a church, and there's always a danger that we become a church where we just throw around these theological ideas that we might affirm with our minds, but then we never apply them to our lives or let them sink into our hearts. Because when we do that, that's not discipleship, that's just playing games. The first thing uh, I think we need to do to, to actually take hold of this is, is to do what we began by thinking about today, remembering that we are citizens of heaven and having that perspective as we go through life, keeping our eyes fixed on Christ, keeping our eyes fixed on home, keeping our eyes fixed on our end goal and viewing all of our present circumstances, all of our present sufferings in light of that. But I also think that Paul gives us three other ways in this passage of things we might need to do if we're going to live out our identity as children of God, if we're going to step in to the transforming work that the Holy Spirit wants to do in us. I'm going to read it again together because I think it's so good. But one thing I do, says Paul, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And then in verse 17, he says, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you, as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. And so three key things. And the first key thing of this, I think, is forgetting what is behind. Now, this isn't about forgetting everything. It's not that the past becomes irrelevant when we become a Christian, because the Bible also tells us that we need to remember quite a lot. It, it teaches us to retell stories, particularly the stories of what God has done in our lives. We're to retell those stories, to remind ourselves of those stories. But I think the forgetting that Paul is talking about is, is forgetting the things that will rob us of our identity in Christ, forgetting the things that will rob us of intimacy with God, forgetting the things that make you think that you're not good enough for God, Forgetting the things in your past that the devil tries to use to shame you in moments of weakness. I heard a quote, I can't remember who said this, um, but I heard it a long time ago, and, and I, I think it's great. Uh, let sin be a reference, but don't let it become your residence. It's good to remember where we've come from, because we can remember all that Christ has done for us. But it's important, and it's important that we, we remember so that we don't backslide as well, and so that we can praise the Saviour who died to forgive us, but we aren't called to live in our identity as sinners. We're called to live in our identity as children of God. And some of you need to hear this. Nothing you have ever done, nothing you will ever do will stop God loving you. So don't be robbed with intimacy by God by things that Jesus died to forgive you of, right? You know, Paul was an amazing guy, an amazing ministry by any stretch of the imagination, amazing evangelist. But he wouldn't have had any of those things if he was grasping on uh, to his sin. Instead, he was grasping hold of his identity in Christ. He wasn't living in his past mistakes because, boy, did Paul also have some baggage that he was bringing on the journey with him. If you want to read about it this week, read 1 Timothy chapter 1. It's a great chapter of scripture. Uh, and Paul tells us in that that he was a blasphemer. He was a persecutor. He was a violent man. Uh, he goes on to say, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst, says Paul. So Paul was not some holier-than-thou super saint. He knew the depth of his sin, uh, but he lived in the even deeper love of Jesus. One thing that will stop us living out our identity as children of God is living in our past mistakes. Living in self-pity rather than living in God's peace. So don't do that, because it will stop us experiencing the transformation that God wants to do in our lives. The second thing Paul talks about is to, to live as citizens of heaven is straining toward what is ahead. But this is linked with 
uh, forgetting what is behind as well, because it fits with that larger theme of Philippians. Um, and I think this is about not living in past victories as well. Not living in past sin, but also not living in past victories, past achievements, past encounters. Because Paul had reasons for pity and regret, but he also had reasons for pride, right? Like quite the resume before Christ. We read about it last week. Quite the resume after Christ, church planter, evangelist, missionary, all these amazing things. If anyone had reason for ego, it was Paul. I mean, he was writing scripture. Um, it's a, it, he had reason to boast. And yet he says, I want to keep straining for what is ahead. I'm not going to rest in those past victories, those past encounters, those past experiences of God. I have a holy angst for more. Uh, perhaps as individuals or as a church, we have reason to thank God, to have pride, and, and we should give thanks to God for the things he's done. But likewise, we're not called to live in past victories. We're not called to live um, in, in those past successes, those past encounters. Let them be a reference, but not a residence. A reference that gives us confidence in God, but not a residence so that we're content to stay as things are. Resting in past vi- victories, past encounters will, will make us prideful and it will make us apathetic. Let's not think for a second that God's done all he wants to do in us individually or in us together. But let's keep straining forwards. Let's keep wanting more of Christ personally and together. And so that's that paradox. We need to be content in our identity in Christ, but we need to have a complete holy discontent for the status quo. Knowing that like Paul, we have yet to obtain all that God wants to do in and through us. We are yet to arrive at our goal. But really important that it is holy discontent we are called to, not sinful discontent, not feeling anxious or fearful towards God, not feeling upset or or, or not feeling that as if God is upset with you or frustrated with you, but knowing who you are, but wanting to go deeper still. Know Christ ever deeper, worship ever deeper, not resting in past encounters of God, but straining, being hungry for more. I'm fascinated um, by the words that Paul uses in our New Testament, not just in Philippians, throughout the New Testament, uh, the type of words he uses when he talks about what faith is. Because I wonder, are they the type of words that we think about when we think of faith? Words like strain, possess, pursue. These are like, let's get going words, right? These are hungry words. These are active words. Like, let's live in, let's live all in for Jesus as as if he is the only prize there is. Not the the meek and mild kind of Christianity, but the kind of faith that is transformative. Now, I said I I wanted this sermon to be more than just a concept uh, that we can affirm with our minds but never apply to our lives. So what what does that look like? What does it look like to strain toward what is ahead? As I was thinking and praying this week, I think one of the things it means is knowing yourself. Knowing yourself really well like being really good at introspection as a Christian, which I don't think the world is set up to make us good at that. But where are you weak in your walk with Christ? Where are you strong? And what are you going to do about it? Have a holy discontent for the areas of your life, your spirituality, where you want to see Holy Spirit growth. You know, it's okay to set spiritual goals if, if you want to do that. As long as we're not measuring our relationship with God by them, it's okay to have spiritual goals. Here's me, some, some public confession. Right? I, I love the Bible. I, I always have. I, I came to faith the first time I heard someone preach from this book. I, I had read it within six months of becoming a Christian. I love reading the Bible. I love spending time in devotion with the Bible. I like to study the Bible. You know, when I come across those weird bits that other people just sort of skip over and go, that's weird, um, I can't forget about it. Like, I, I need to know what it's saying. I, I preach whole sermon series based on the weird bits of the Bible. Um, sorry about that. Uh, but you, you called me. You, know, you knew what you were getting yourselves into. But when it comes to, to deep prayer, like really deep prayer, I like it, but it's much harder work for me than reading my Bible. I can slip into reading the Bible really easily. But deep prayer, being deliberate about deepening my prayer life, is, is something that takes a lot more effort, a lot more straining for me. And I need the wisdom and the experience of others who are much better at it than me to, to guide me in that journey. If it's, if, if it's not something I'm straining towards, it will be one of the first things that Satan will rob me of. So what are we weak on? What are we strong on? What are we going to do about it? In my experience, I've never just stumbled into becoming more godly. I've never woken up one day, hit my head on a door frame, which happens a lot, and, um, and, and just become more godly. Um, I've never just stumbled into transformation accidentally. 
Because our relationship with God is just that. It's a relationship. It's two ways. So the Holy Spirit does that work, but we have to make ourselves available to him. If we're serious about being transformed in Christ, we need to be ready to strive and to strain, forgetting what is behind, straining towards what is ahead. What is ahead. Not living in pity, for it will disable us. Not living in pride, or it will make us apathetic. You know, Satan is happy with either pride or pity. Uh, so let's keep a hungry and healthy desire for more of Jesus, all the while knowing who we are in him. And then the third and final nugget of wisdom that I think we can find here when it comes to how do we practically live as citizens of heaven? How do we seek to live transformed lives? By getting around people that are more mature than us, especially in those areas where we're weak. You know, if we're, we're weak in generosity, get around people that are really generous. If we're weak in patience, get around people that you just look at and you go, how are you so patient? Um, we talked about role models last time out, so I'm not going to hammer it home again. Uh, but here, Paul says, follow my example um, and, and, and follows up, follow others who live like we do. Keep your eyes on those people. Watch them. Speak to them. You know, this is super countercultural thing to do because we live in a, in a competitive world where when we come across someone who's stronger than us in a certain area, the natural reaction for us is always going to be to put the barriers up. Right? To, to feel threatened or intimidated or, or insecure. You know, it's far easier to just surround ourselves with people that are weaker than us or, or are equals, uh, to share wisdom rather than receive wisdom, to feel superior. But if we're serious, if we're really serious about wanting to live as citizens of heaven, then we need to live like citizens of heaven and not like the world does. And that's the beauty of church. I love the, the uh, image that, that Claire gave us of that, of that marathon runner. You know, sometimes I am that, that lactic acid field guy that needs someone that knows what they're doing, that has walked that path to just carry me, carry me that next step of the journey to help me keep straining forwards. We need one another. So get around people who are strong in the areas that you're weak and be a sponge. I'm going to bring it into land after those three things for us to think about. just want to emphasize, just to conclude, Really important, we don't need to transform ourselves in order to earn God's love. But when we receive God's love, and the more we rest in God's love, the more we will be hungry to live transformed lives. You know, we talked about a vision for revival in this place and wanting to see revival, not just here, but across the Axe Valley. You know, if we're serious about that, if we're serious about that and not just playing games, then we need to be hungry. If we're hungry for revival, we need to be hungry for that revival to begin in us. You know, if we want to see the world change, if we want to see society change, then we need to be ready to be changed. We need to be transformed in Christ. We need to keep our eyes fixed on what is to come, even as we live full, in, full on and all in for Christ in this world, knowing that our citizenship is not here, that this is not home. Because the amazing thing is that transformation that we get to experience in part now is just a foretaste of that final transformation, that total transformation to come. Because Jesus, who began that good work in us, is coming back. Resurrection life is coming. When what we see in part, we will then see in full. When the transformation that has happened in part will happen in full. When we will check in our citizenship of heaven in full. Not, this, not some disembodied existence, but an embodied resurrection life in a renewed creation. How amazing is that going to be? Let's be hungry for a glimpse of that now. Let's be hungry to forget what is behind and strive towards what is ahead. Amen. I'm going to hand over to Claire, who's going to lead us in a. In a